supporting local efforts to create a culture that cherishes life and fosters deep and meaningful human connections, allowing highly trained school personnel to have access to firearms. The President's School Safety Commission issues its final report. Two Parkland parents are here to talk about it. Schools need guidance on best practices and what to do first, what to do second. Crime and punishment. Post Parkland, the school security report rewinds student discipline guidelines. This holiday should be about joy, not about sadness. Speaking out against drunk and drug driving, a Miami mother who lost her daughter in a DUI is the new national president of Mothers Against Drunk Driving, and she is with us live. Good morning. The government is closed. We are open and glad you could join us. Merry Christmas. Today, we are going to focus on proposed changes to make schools safer. Those changes uh, contained in a report issued this week by a presidential commission. It's 177 pages and 93 recommendations for schools nationwide, born of critical lessons learned from the massacre at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Several Douglas High fathers were with the president as he released the report this week. It recommends some big picture changes covering school <clears throat> threat assessments, training, identifying, treating mental illness, and things like cyber bullying. It also calls for rescinding federal student discipline guidelines that had been put in place to reverse racial discrimination originally, but according to the report, had unintended consequences. Ryan Petty was one of the parents there in D.C. this week. He lost his daughter, Elena, who was 14 in the Stoneman Douglas tragedy. Lori Aladef's daughter, Alyssa, died that day. In her effort to make change, she ran for and won a seat on this Broward County School Board. We appreciate you both coming in. Good morning. Good morning. And thank so you. glad you were here. Valuable voices for us. Yes, indeed. Ryan Petty, when this report was issued, you were at the White House on Tuesday. You said you hoped that people could look at the recommendations and find things to agree about and work on, move forward. Which recommendations are the ones that you support? Well, there's so many to like uh, in this report. Um, what th This is the most comprehensive look at school safety uh, uh, done by the federal government ever. Right. And so there are lots of good recommendations and ideas contained herein. 95% um, of them, I think, are things we can all agree on because they focus on, on issues that are not controversial. There, there are a few things in here and a few things that didn't make it into the report that I think drive a lot of the controversy and a lot of the discussion about the report, but I'm hoping we can focus on the things that are actually in the report. So many of the things in the report actually mirror what you and fellow mm -hmm. commissioners on the State Commission have come up with and are about to, I guess, next month. Lori Aladef on the school board, now that you have a seat yes. at the table in policymaking, one of, one of the, I think to your point, one of the more controversial components of the commission report is rewinding this kind of disciplinary guidance meant to, according to statistics, even the playing field racially, because statistics had shown that uh, students of color were disciplined more harshly and more often. And, and so there was this guidance in place that came up with what Broward County calls a promise program. I know Miami-Dade County and other districts have similar programs. This rewinds that uh, because it had unintended consequences. And I think in your district, some of your fellow school board members have called this week really unnerved about what that might mean. Give us your take on that. So I believe as a school board member that we really need to look hard into the Promise Program and the recommendations put out by the President and the MSD Commission. And we need to re reflect on Promise and to make changes to Promise to meet the needs for all of our students because all of our students belong to deserve to go to school in a safe environment. We should probably just headline Promise Program and other programs like it will take a student who might be in some minor trouble and instead of turning him or her over to law enforcement, put them through programs or something. Mm -hmm. it, it almost, it, it sounds like it is a bit more lenient, although it's not meant to be leniency, it's meant to be redirective. And, and so um, the shooter at the Marjorie Don Stoneman Douglas High School mm -hmm. There was some confusion whether he had been through this program or not. He had been, but hadn't shown up. Right. So, so what, Ryan, do you think should be the policy about this kind of discipline from zero tolerance right. all the way up the spectrum to 
you know, what do we do with these kids so that they're not law enforcement yeah. bound? This is an area that I worked very closely with the Department of Education on over the past few months in the Office of Civil Rights. So this is an issue that's near and dear to my heart. Um, and I was pleased to see the recommendations reversed. So let, let's step back. Um, the idea of giving kids a second chance, I think is a good one. The racial disparity that exists between um, minority students and white students is real. Yeah. Um, but these policies were based on a, the false premise that our teachers and the administrators are um, racist. And so therefore that bias that they have is causing uh, this disparity. It, it turns out it's, it, it's not actually the case. And then when you look at the results of the policy being place, in place for several years, it didn't actually work. The disparity still exists. So we have to solve that problem. This was not the way to do it. And the unintended consequences are 17 dead people at Marjorie Stillman Douglas. Yeah. Well, um, one of the many failings. That one of the many failings. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Lori, you as a school board member, I'm sure you before you were elected to the school board in August, uh, we have heard Robert Runcie, including on this program, talk about the, the, the crisis of the classroom to prison pipeline where kids get in trouble for relatively minor things at school and then they get referred, as Glenna said, to the juvenile justice system and sometimes they get in the criminal justice system and never really get out. So what is a golden mean? What is a way to address this issue? So I think we need to look at the culture in the school and what is going on and how we are implementing social emotional learning, character education, and we need to do a better job within the culture of the school. And then we also need to look at our disciplinary matrix and how many chances that we are giving our students. Mm -hmm. And you know, some, some kids do deserve to go into promise and deserve those second chances, but the kids that, I think the pendulum has We've swung from not disciplining, you know, and we need to come somewhere into the middle. It was too lenient before. Right. Yeah. And, and I think one of the things that we're learning from the, your commission's report and, and just the, the documents we've been getting from this investigation is that the mental health component for students and, and, and crime is enormous, hard mm -hmm. to even mm -hmm. overstate it. And part of the commission reports was a real focus on mental illness and in, and in the federal report that came out, right. uh, all kinds of recommendations about mental health professionals and that kind of thing, but it's, but it's an unfunded mandate, which there was one organization, uh, National Association of School Psychologists, who put out a paper, they took real issue, well, we've been saying this all along, we need to fund this, and, and the federal commission report says yes without the money. Yeah, I think, again, this was a first step, and there's more to do, and I think funding around mental health programs in our schools, which is where we see, um, where we have an opportunity to intervene uh, with some of these students that are, are having discipline issues or on, are on that school to prison pipeline yeah. uh, on that road, um, I think that's where the opportunity exists. We need to go back and talk with uh, the Congress about funding some of these mandates. Mm -hmm. I know the recommendations out of the MSD Commission are for the state legislature to yeah. continue to fund and increase funding for mental health. We have to identify the potential threats in our school and intervene before they get uh, right. to, the, to the point uh, that the shooter at MSD got to. Yeah, Ryan, I remember uh, covering a Miami-Dade school board mem a meeting a couple of years ago where when they were in a financial crisis, you know, almost the first people to cut were school yeah. counselors. Right. And they have been viewed as almost expendable. Mm -hmm. But I think everything, these reports, state report, federal report, your own personal experiences tell you that the kids need counseling and they need these people on staff at every school. And the nexus seems to be the school because it's for, for a lot of reasons it's not happening at home. It's not happening with yeah. the family. When you, when you look at uh, some of the things we looked at in closed session at the commission, there were lots of services provided to, to the shooter at MSD. Lots mm -hmm. of services, sometimes Including two, and three, health services. two and three times a day they were at that home. Um, but, but the nexus seems to be the school because the school had information about the shooter. The mental health profession had, had some information and law enforcement had the information. The problem, they weren't talking. Right. And another thing this federal report pushes are changes in FERPA, 
um, the educational privacy. That's like and, HIPAA for and HIPAA, education. HIPAA yeah. and FERPA are, yeah. are being um, clarified at the federal so level. So one agency can talk to another, share this information? Yeah, too often our agencies, our, di our school districts, hide behind these federal privacy restrictions and, and use them as an excuse not to share information right. with the public or with others that could help. And in this case, law enforcement, school district, and mental health should have been communicating about the shooter at MSD. You know, as you're, as you're talking about this, I think about what we just recently learned. One of you know, the people who were right there at the school on that day as it was about to happen knew full well and I think one of the quotes in one of the documents was Andrew Medina, this the first school mm -hmm. monitor to mm -hmm. see him walk in, said, oh, there's that crazy guy. Yep. They knew. They knew. And yet still did not act. Yeah. No. I wanted to say, though, I think it's amazing, though, that we're bringing the mental health and the need for the programs in the schools, making it a top priority. They're recommending um, mental health counselors, one per 250 students, and we are nowhere near that right now. So like Ryan said, we need to get more federal money, more state money needs to be able to go into our public schools because we need to take away that stigmatism of mental health and by bringing it in the schools and allowing the children to get help there will help alleviate that and help and be able to help give the students the help that they need in well, school. I, I hope some state legislators are listening to both of you and to the commissions because it's going to take some more money and it's going to take money from Tallahassee indeed. All right, stay with us. We'll continue our conversation here in just a minute. Welcome back this morning. We are talking about the Presidential, Presidential Commission on School Safety and its findings. Ryan Petty was on that, and Lori Aladeff is a member of the school board. Lori, one of the recommendations not in the Presidential Commission findings, the recommendations, is anything about gun control. And in fact, what it says is there should be more guns, more highly trained individuals on college high school, elementary, middle school campuses. Do you think that's the answer? I don't think that we should arm teachers at all. 
Uh, we do not ask our doctors in our hospitals to have guns when they see their patients. Right. So I don't think that teachers should have guns um, and their job is to teach. Uh, but I do think though that we should have appropriate number of law enforcement officers to protect our campuses based on the size of the campus yeah. and other needs. Well, let me ask you to follow up. Miami-Dade County Public Schools has its own police department. Uh, Broward County Public Schools do not. They rely on BSO and municipal departments. Mm -hmm. Is it working okay? There needs to be, I think, further communications between the different law enforcements with the school districts, with the different cities. Mm -hmm. um, we can do a better job. I think that there needs to be a specific ratio between number of students and SRO officers mm -hmm. needed on campus. Right. There was, uh, that day, there was one, Scott Peterson, who had, as we ha now know, all kinds of other issues. But R Ryan, I, please do weigh in on that because your commission at the state level, um, the sheriff uh, who is the commission chair mm -hmm. has come out and, and I think in the draft report we see there is a pot of money to fund employees, not teachers, but school employees who wish to be trained and it, it's sort of a local decision. Local districts have to buy into it first. So there's a lot of, a lot of wheels to have to turn to get armed personnel on campus, but generally speaking, it is a recommendation. It is, and, and I think there were two things we tried to do at the commission. One was, so we have counties in Florida that um, where school districts would like to implement the Guardian program and have more armed personnel on campus, the sheriff is refusing for a number of reasons to um, set up a Guardian program and train those that want to participate. We asked the legislature to clarify the legislative intent behind Senate Bill 7026 and, and change some language. Language matters as we've learned uh, unfortunately in this tragedy and others from sort of may set it up to shall sure. set it up. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we asked them to change that and then we asked the legislature to look at extending the definition of who on campus uh, including some educational um, um, uh, staff and teachers uh, that volunteer for the program and are willing to submit themselves to the training necessary both the background check, the mental health screening, and and the firearms training needed, uh, so that so that they could uh, in fact become guardians. We don't have enough law enforcement officers to cover all the schools in the state. Right. Uh, we have uh, we we're we're hiring guardians as fast as we can, but we still don't have enough. So we have a gap that we need to cover, and that's why we asked the legislature to take a look at that. Yeah, Ryan. One of the recommendations in the federal report is the creation of extreme risk protection yes. orders. Yes where a law enforcement you know, can go in yep. for a student, presumably, or somebody who is a risk to themselves or others, especially on a campus, yep. and you know, with good judgment, seize their weapons. Right. I mean, that just seems like a no-brainer. It, it, it is a no-brainer, and um, I'm, I'm pleased to say there are 13 states that have enacted that. I think eight of them since the Stoneman Douglas tragedy. Uh, the last time that I had numbers in the state of Florida had been used about 400 times. We've, mm -hmm. We have actually done stories on the first few times. And, uh, Fantastic law. Yeah. Uh, solves a big problem that law enforcement had. There was, no, there was no way to remove firearms from somebody that was threatening right. themselves or others. And this, this helps solve not only things like school shootings and mass shootings, but it also helps with the suicide problem. Mm -hmm. And so it's a fantastic uh, uh, um, measure, and I'm pleased to see the federal government encouraging the other states to adopt these same risk protection orders. Like a, like a Baker Act, but for weapons. Absolutely, okay. yeah. and, and law enforcement, you talk to law enforcement, they didn't have the tools they needed to stop these things, and now they do. Right. Um, excuse me, Lori, I, I did want to ask you, that some of these recommendations in the federal report, as indeed in the state commission report, they just seem so simple. For example, secure corners in classrooms where students who were under threat could go to a corner where a shooter, God help us if there were one, you know, could not hit a student. Uh, that doesn't seem so hard to achieve. It doesn't seem so hard to achieve, and if, in my daughter's situation, if there was a hard corner, she could have ran there and right. hypothetically could have been alive today. 
Uh, but however, there is training that is involved with creating that hard corner because unfortunately the next shooter is studying what happened in Parkland. And by yeah. just saying, taping off a corner of the room and saying, this is where you go, that's not the it's only no solution. Guarantee. No, it, it's, it's changing. You know, what's so glaring about the, the hard corner and, and concepts like that, those were, I don't know if they were recommendations or a mandate at Broward County Schools two years ago and had not been done. And, and to me, that's sort of the headline of how much complacency and lack of leadership and bureaucracy got in the way of what sounds like common sense in so many ways, but, but the kinds of safety components on down the line that were already there, but no one in a position of power made it happen. Yeah, and we called that out in the MSD Commission report and we named names. Um, there was a lack of interest in this. Uh, at, at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, I think at the district with the administration, and certainly I've been no fan of uh, our sheriff uh, and his lack of leadership on this issue. From the radios not working, uh, which he should have fixed, to the wrong policy on active shooter, yeah. to the lack of training. He's, he, I think he, he represents a clear and present danger, to use a, a movie title, uh, to the citizens of Broward County, and quite frankly, his deputies. It's an officer safety issue, too. At the school, I mean, they, they were joking. They were aware of the threat and were joking about which teachers and administrators were on Cruz's hit list. I mean, this is the level uh, of, of, of lack of ur sense of urgency that, they, that, this, um, that these school administrators had. And it's, it, as a father, uh, it, it, it's absolutely mind-boggling that I sent my daughter to school that day thinking she would come home and knowing that these people were joking about a school shooting uh, and which one of them would be on a list. I, I would be deeply angry and uh, never... This wound, I know, for both of you is going to continue for the rest of your lives, but we are very grateful you've come in and talked about important ideas to make schools safer, including... And we'll continue to, Stoneman and I hope you'll stay in touch. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah, you right. so much. Thanks very Thank much. You. All right, coming up, Mothers Against Drunk Driving Mad has a new national president, Helen Whitty. She is from South Florida, and she's going to join us next.
The holiday season is upon us. It's a wonderful time of year, lots of parties, good times, and often those parties come with lots of booze. The downside comes behind the wheel. And we in South Florida have covered too much heartbreak from DUI crimes, including the case of one mother who has turned pain into activism. Helen Whitty is the new national president of Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Helen Marie, her daughter, was a Palmetto High sophomore 18 years ago when she was killed by a young woman her age who was driving drunk and distracted. Helen, good morning. Good morning, good morning, to morning. to you. We're good morning. So, we're so glad you are here. The message, don't drink, don't drug, don't drive. Yes, absolutely. And I'm so grateful to be here this morning in front of this week. Thank because you. this week is one of the most dangerous yes. of the year. And really, we just want people to be safe. We want people to have a great time. Right. But we want people to understand that alcohol is still the number one killer on our roads. Mm -hmm. You know, we were, we were just talking 18 years. That's a, a generation. And I, I will share with you, I never drive that stretch of Red Road without thinking about your daughter that we covered and your family. Um, and 18 years later, we're still covering yes. DUI crimes. What do you think does not compute? What, where is that disconnect that it keeps happening? That is a complicated question and a very good one. And I think what we need to do, especially in front of this week, is take personal responsibility for yourself and for your loved ones around you. And here's my simple equation. If you drink, don't drive. If you drive, don't drink. Um, and, and it seems to be simple. You know, um, if, if I can get into some law here, because among the things that we cover is the aftermath in the courts, right. where these people, often young people, have to go and, and realize what they've done, and it's a, another heartbreak. But there is a component, a hit and run DUI. We have covered a lot of people who drive mm -hmm. and then they run and leave a person there. And we realize that the penalties for a hit and run, even when involving a death, are less severe, much less severe than for a DUI manslaughter charge, almost making it a good idea for someone to go home for a night and sober up before you turn yourself in. Is that something that MAD might address at oh, the state oh, legislature? Oh, we have. You Glenna, have? we have. Yes. We, we, uh, the Aaron Cohen Life Protection Act, uh, we passed. I joined in with that family because Aaron Cohen was left dead and dying right. on, on the Rickenbacker Causeway. Yeah, he was yeah. the brilliant young man, part of yes. the cycling group, yes. going over the bridge His, over there to keep us game. Yes. And, uh, and the driver left him uh, and went home and covered up his car. Right. And because he was not given much penalty, it was under a year in Dade County Jail, that family gathered together and now it is illegal. If you drink and leave, well, first of all, if you leave the scene of a fatality, you will be given the same charges as you would if you had been impaired. So it is, and that came just from 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 your that work family, and from the Cohen family, and from Mad joining, yeah. and and there were a lot of people in this community that were outraged. Yeah, yeah, we were. Yes, uh, in the 18 years since you lost your daughter, uh, we have seen ride sharing grow up. Now yes. Uber, Lyft are available, and I've got to say, in my family, I've got a couple of young guys in their 20s. And if they're going to go out drinking, they say, oh, I'm going to Uber tonight. The, yes, we love it. We love uh, ride share. It, it is a wonderful thing. And so many people are taking advantage of it. But unfortunately, it's kind of counterintuitive because you would think that the deaths are going down where the deaths are increasing, especially over the holidays. Right. They've increased by 35% in the last five years. So it's still an issue that we need to deal with and just make sure that your loved ones, listen, if you're having noche buena, if you're, no, whatever, keep them home. If, the, if they've, somebody's been drinking too much in your home, keep them on your couch, right. stop them. We need to take this personally so that it doesn't become personal. You know, not only rideshare, but it's worth it to say on many holidays, there are tow companies or cab companies that offer free rides. Mm. Yes. It doesn't even cost, cost anything. Yes. So in your January 1st, you take the helm as president yes, nationally. 
Um, yes. Is there w w is there a new priority? What's what's different? What what does Mad have planned for the next year? Well, a lot. We'll have a new CEO coming on board, and we will be refocusing on traffic safety. I think it's one of those things that perhaps people think, oh yeah, that's dealt with. Well, it's not. Mm -hmm. Thirty people die a day mm. in this country due to impaired driving. Let's talk about alcohol impaired, marijuana impaired, drug impaired. So we, we need to change that and stop that. That's a, that's a good point, that drunk driving is not always alcohol. Right, and, and impaired fact, driving, in, yes. In the case of your family's tragedy, that was the case. And now we have distracted driving to right. add to that now that everybody carries cell phones and text messages. All those things are important. Drunk driving is still the number one killer. Yeah. Helen, I've got to say, I know over the last many years, uh, you were comforted, consoled, counseled by uh, MAD, members of Mothers Against Drunk Driving, and now you've been doing that yourself. It's a privilege. It's a privilege and an honor because people from MAD have walked alongside me the whole time. They're still with me. And I am meeting families across South Florida who have lost their loved ones. Mm -hmm. And so I want, it's, it's, a, it's an honor to walk with them. You know, I think what we've learned is that there is no greater force than a parent on a mission. <laughs> and, um, there you go. We appreciate you coming in. Thank you. Being with and us. Happy holidays to you. Yeah. Thank we you. appreciate what you and do. And we salute your mission. Good luck. Well, thank you very much for your support. All right, Helen Whitty. Up next, we're going to take the big topics of the week's news to, yes, you got it, the round table. Stay tuned. <laughs> well, as always, we have so much to talk about, a lot of ground to cover with our Powerhouse Roundtable. We've got a great one for you today. So introductions come first. Marlon Hill with us today, an attorney with the Hamilton Miller and Bertha Sill firm and a past president of the Caribbean Bar Association who rarely sleeps. Rosemary <laughs> O'Hara is the editorial page editor of the Sun Sentinel and a veteran Florida journalist. And Chris Smith is an attorney with the Trip Scott Law Firm in Fort Lauderdale and a former state senator from Fort Lauderdale. 
Good morning. Thank you for being Good here morning. on this holiday weekend. Absolutely. Noche Eve, buena, almost. Eve, 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 Eve. <laughs> and the weather's cooperating. Oh, yes. It is, it is delightful. Uh, Rosemary, here, this presidential commission that we spoke about earlier with Lori Allardef, Ryan Petty, uh, it makes, I think, some reasonable, good recommendations. But when it says it needs more, even highly trained individuals, more guns on campus, uh, and it says nothing about uh, banning assault rifles or, you know, the guns that have been used tr historically in these school shootings, it seems like a terrible oversight. Well, more guns on campus is also a recommendation of the State Commission, a sense that, you know, these things happen so fast, so many people are killed so quickly. Right. We need to arm more people, more teachers. And yet, you know, teachers don't go into teaching in order to, to take people out. Right. And we saw sheriff's deputies who were afraid right. to go into the building. To that, they didn't deal with gun safety. Um, is a huge omission and it colors their work. That said, I think that Lori was absolutely right, that in our society we have these pendulums that you know go from one extreme to the other, and I do believe that um, there has been a culture of leniency in mm. the Broward County school system, in part created by these policies that uh, have, have encouraged teachers not to report violent incidents. You know, one of the things we did not speak about with Ryan and Lori mm -hmm. was the fact that those kind of programs, like the Promise Program and whatever they call it, has been also used by districts to sort of, I don't want to say cook the books, although that kind of is what we've seen. They don't want the statistics in Tallahassee to show a high crime district. And, um, and to their credit, and no disrespect, that's a lot of what those statistics have been lowered as, as uh, looking at these districts, like high crime districts, because of those kind of, of right. programs. Well, you know, um, Rosemary mentioned it um, correctly in terms of the culture, the culture of the school system or school systems. Remember now, this is not just a local Parkland yes. mm -hmm. Cold Springs issue anymore, another state of Florida issue, it's a national issue. So the culture of discipline, how do we apply discipline to ensure a great learning environment for all kids without any inequity. How, how do we? Well, that's part of the culture that we have to change, right? So okay. this whole idea of getting rid of the, pro the promise, getting rid of the baby with, with the bath, bath water may be a big yeah. mistake. Uh, and Chris, I think, jump in here I think Rosemary this. made a good point. She said the pendulum swings back and forth because before we had pro pro uh, programs like Promise, we had an absorbent amount of black and brown children being charged with crimes in, cl in class. I mean, we had, we had a stage where when I first got elected in 98 in the legislature, we made a lot of misbehavior into mis misdemeanors, yeah. and we got a lot of kids that are getting criminal records by mm -hmm. going to school and doing things that maybe getting in, in, into an argument in school, those became misdemeanors. So the pendulum swung, and now maybe it needs to correct itself. So, I mean, I mean there, there's a lot of more discussion and maybe get some middle ground, but I just don't want that pendulum to swing all the way back to these kids leaving school with a record that's going to follow them the, their whole life. And, and you know what, that it, that is addressed in the commission report as mm -hmm as a way to, there is not explicit bias. There, there just is not, but there is implicit bias. And I don't think anybody can mm -hmm. refute that the statistics show that. And what's interesting in the federal report is that it says there are components in place in the federal law if anyone is showing bias, intentional bias. And I, I thought that was interesting because intentional bias is rarely shown. It's yeah. the implicit bias that's the issue. Yeah. I mean, when you, when you get kids in school, I mean, my, my son that you know, comes here, six foot, 300 pounds. You know, he got into a, a wrestling match with other, other defensive linemen last year in school and got into serious trouble because you had two 300 pound black men wrestling in the class and a small teacher. Now, of course, she's going to report that a little different than if, you know, my daughter or, or someone's daughter or someone gets mm -hmm. it. So, I mean, there, there's a natural bias but we got to make sure that all the kids are treated the same mm -hmm. and we stop criminalizing just misbehavior. I really hate what happened in Parkland and I think what, what the shooter did was atrocious and he fell through a lot of gaps, mm -hmm. but I hate to close up those gaps and go back to the days of these kids. But the kids big, bigger issue though, Chris, is how do we catch 
um, any type of behavior that could be a problem in the future. This is the real, the real gap in the school system. Yeah. What, what are we really looking for and what kind of infrastructure and well, ecosystem if, we can put I, in the school if system? If I may together? say, this week, thanks to Freedom of Information Act lawsuits brought by the Sun Sentinel and the Herald, I think we have seen this whole kind of cavalcade of new information yeah. from BSO into the investigation. And Rosemary, what it has shown me, and it's easy to say in retrospect, is that there were red flags for years yeah. with this kid, yes. for years, yes. at every level, middle school, high school, and mm -hmm. he was failed at every level. Yes, um, and to the point, to your point, I would say that um, one of the things that we have found out as a result of these investigations and Sun Sentinel investigations is that there were police called to Stoneman Douglas for because they thought that police needed to be there. Mm -hmm. And those kinds of crimes were not being reported right. to the state. And we need to hold the school accountable for failing to fill out, to your point, trying to keep the cook the books, make it look like this school is mm -hmm. so safe. And to yours, that, you know, since the time he was three years old, he had 69 violent incidents. Right. They, the superintendent describes him as a kid who was unforgettable mm -hmm. to anyone who ever met him. And yet so many people at so many places just kind of did this. Right. Not always, I shouldn't, I mean, well-meaning people, some of them, but. Uh, well, some well-meaning, and as Glenn has said mm -hmm. earlier, the school monitor, Andrew yeah. Medina, yeah. saw him coming and said, oh, there is crazy boy. I mean, yeah. if you've got a nickname like that, yeah. and you've been warned that if anybody ever going to shoot up a school, it is that and kid. No, and no code red. As Stay tuned. Yes. You're first when we come back. In your, okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay, got to hit a commercial <laughs> break. Stay tuned. So More round table after the break. We are back with our Eve, Eve, Eve roundtable. Marlon Hill, Rosemary O'Hara, Chris Smith talking about the Federal Commission on School Safety, um, mental health, and the guidance counselors in school we were yeah. talking about, and you wanted yeah, to. The school board member mentioned in. it in your, in your earlier block of the lack of funding for it and sometimes the lack of those professionals in those schools. And to, to our point that we made earlier, 
if you have the professionals that can make those assessments, that can make those assessments of a Nicholas Cruz who has shown tendencies and who they were making jokes about, yet those professionals need to make those professional assessments as opposed to the kids that are just getting into a fight in the playground right. after school. So we need funding from Tallahassee to make sure we have professionals in those schools to make those assessments. Absolutely. And one of those professionals that I think maybe may needed is the own um, school police system. As opposed to broad sheriffs, I think that the school board should have its own police force. Yeah. Like Miami-Dade. Like Miami-Dade Miami Dade has yeah. actually contracted with some cities to yeah. put that city's police officers. But I think schools. having your own school for it allows those officers to be trained in a very particular way to deal with kids and students. Wasn't Scott Peterson, though, was a was a Broward deputy who was a school resource officer. 28 he, years mm -hmm. he was a school, in that school. resource officer. So, uh, yeah, and 10 years, I think, he was at the at Stoneman Douglas. You know, one of the um, when, one of the big failings, and now we let's, you know, it's not just about guns. It's mm -hmm. about a lot of people failed us. Um, and one of them is, as I was making the point during the break, that they had a threat assessment on Nicholas Cruz when they were wanted to send, mm -hmm. kick him out of Stoneman Douglas. Yeah. Law enforcement is supposed to be at the table with that. So is the principal, who didn't want to know about threats against his school. Mm -hmm. What happened in that threat assessment that they didn't see a kid who said he wanted to kill, who had a history of, of killing animals, who people were taking their kids mm -hmm. out of the classroom because they were so afraid of him, his teachers were afraid of him. How did that threat assessment not assess the threat that this kid posed? Mm -hmm. Good question. Yeah. All right. Let me move on to... That was to a deep <laughs> breath. That was a deep, well a said. deep breath. <laughs> well said. Amen. Um, we are without a federal government right now, mm. and I think we need to say a few things about that. Uh, Marlon, uh, the fact is uh, it, it may resume Thursday or Friday. Mm -hmm. I mean... It, Emphasis in, on May. In yep. full force, mm -hmm. it may. Uh, but then again, it may not. Most people probably don't know it because TSA is at the airports and the air traffic controllers and the Coast Guard is at their essential services. But, you know, the message it sends to the public at a time of chaos and turmoil in Washington is absolutely yeah. devastating. It's definitely not the way to lead or govern, right? We have had about 20 government shutdowns. We had three this year. Um, the, the last one that we had, um, the longest one was 21 days during um, President Clinton's time. Um, it's unfortunate, you know, we have TSA um, employees now who are put on a happy face and to welcome everyone as they right. travel and across the world. they're not getting paid. And aren't some aren't they the ones who take things? Well, yeah, well, that's their job, but <laughs> well, that's their job. Some, of, some folks are being furloughed um, yeah. and are paid and not doing their job. Right. It's yeah. really just not the way, and the markets are going to show, I believe, when they reopen that this is not the way to run um, one of the well, most the markets, important which economies. Yeah. taken a huge hit, uh, you know, over the last month or the worst month for the markets, the worst December since 1931. Oh, my goodness. I used to have a 401k. It's a 201k. <laughs> 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 Ladies and gentlemen, he's here all week. <laughs> you know, one of the things that are sort of bubbling up from the ground up mm -hmm. are people who are working essential services not being paid, which retroactively they will. But senators and but, congressmen and women and the president, they're still getting paid. But, the, but that's the, the point, shutdown. even retroactively, because just, just look at it. On the first, rent is due. Yeah, of course. On the third, you get a three day notice. If they're not back and paid by the ninth, they're out on the street. Yeah. I mean, we can talk stock markets and talk about Congress people and all, yeah. but you got people that live paycheck to paycheck mm -hmm. and rent is real. If they don't pay their rent on the first, they get a three day notice and there's no legal argument to say that, oh, the government shut down, that's why I didn't pay my rent. And a lot of those TSA agents, a lot of those government employees that are you know, part of this political pawn game, Rent is real, and rent's going to be due on the first. And let's talk about why this is happening. I was it's just going to say. I mean, yeah. first off, people, you know, Washington is, oh, my God, what's happening up there now? But what's happening now is that the, this shutdown is happening because of the budget deal, because the president wants to One fulfill person. a campaign promise. He wants $5 billion to build his wall along the border. Let's all agree we want secure borders. We don't want open borders. Right. But, you know, part of his campaign promise was that Mexico was going to pay for the wall. Right. So, uh, you know, it's, it's just... Well, uh, he's a businessman and everything, he's a businessman. So businessmen, if Mexico's going to pay for it, he should, as a businessman, invoice Mexico. When they send a check back, we'll start building the wall. <laughs> if the wall was going to be like a business, if the wall was going to be effective, Chris, you know, it's something that you should fund. But you know, right. you look along the border; thousands of miles are bordered by a river. 
How are so, you going to build a wall so on this, a this topography this is, this is of the border? Doesn't allow for a wall along okay, all so, eighteen hundred miles, whatever. So uh, the here is. is a border security question right. that has to do with the budget crafting. Where are we going with this? Well, what, the, who blinks? The president needs um, the se yeah. Senate Democrat votes to, to make this happen, right? So if he's there, he maybe he could invite him over for Christmas dinner on <laughs> Tuesday, right? Since he's back at the White House, this is something that he can spend his time wisely, but, right? Maybe that's get, what he could do. Let's get real. This border security was in the budget. There's money in there for border security. Yeah. This is about his border wall. Symbolic. This is about his campaign promise. And this is about, about his speeches. And it's border about security and, is in that budget. And Calder calling him gutless, yeah. you know, because he had caved in to a, a budget without the money for the wall. Can I just we, say happy holidays <laughs> to end this round table? <laughs> Merry Christmas. Merry Thank Christmas. You. Happy Thank holidays. Love you. Happy holidays, everyone. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> All right. Still to come, my personal perspective about a very special anniversary, the return of the Bay of Pigs fighters who were held captive in Cuba. This is a beautiful live look from four tower cams across South Florida. What a day. Cool and beautiful. And here is weather authority meteorologist Brandon Orr with the Sunday forecast. Brandon. Yeah, and we are already a little bit warmer than where we were yesterday. We didn't even make it out of the 60s in Miami yesterday. 69 was our high temperature. Now we're sitting at 71, 72 in Fort Lauderdale. So noticeably warmer. So far, we may add another degree to these temperatures and then bottom out there or top out there, I should say. 0% chance for rain going even into the evening, so don't worry about that. It's actually going to be a pretty nice day. There is a front that's moving our way, but it's going to stay to the north. Mid-70s on Christmas Eve, but check out Christmas Day. Mid to upper 70s. It's going to be a very warm Christmas this year. In fact, it gets warmer than that on the seven-day forecast. We have some 80s on the way. 82 degrees by Friday into Saturday. That's when we see our next chance for rain. Not a washout, just a couple of showers that would be on Thursday and Friday. But even beyond the seven-day forecast, it looks like this warmer air is going to continue into the new year, guys. 
Brandon, thanks. All right, before we leave you today, a personal perspective. In honor of the brave Cuban exiles who fought at the Bay of Pigs, were captured in prison. We're talking about more than 1,100 men. They came home to Miami on Christmas Eve, 1962. Here's some old footage of that homecoming. Brigade 2506 vets coming off the plane at Miami Airport. It was December 24, 1962, after the brigade was beaten at Playa Giron. These men were put in Castro's worst prisons. They were beaten, tortured, starved. Some were executed. But more than 1,100 men survived, and they were swapped for $53 million in food and medicine through the intercession of President John F. Kennedy. And after 20 months in captivity, they came home to Miami, defeated in battle, undefeated in spirit. Many went on to serve in the U.S. Armed Forces, particularly later in Vietnam, and 56 years later, some are still with us. Today, the eve of the 56th anniversary of their return, I want to honor these courageous men of Brigade 2506 who risked their lives to take back their homeland. Altogether, 1,133 prisoners were ransomed from the Castro regime. They came back to Miami to become productive members of society, contributing citizens. You can see their story at the Museum of Brigade 2506 in Little Havana. If you've never been there, I urge you to go. You will see the names and faces of heroes, and today we pay them tribute. That is our story for today. Thank you. My perspective, hope you have a great Sunday. Remember, as always, stay informed, get involved, have a great Christmas. And get online because you can catch any of our programs right there on local10.com. And you can also subscribe to our This Week in South Florida Roundtable podcast online. And if you stick around, stay tuned for SoFlo Health, which is right here next.